Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kosten, and this is joint work with a lot of people. So uh, my students and my colleagues from Bucharest, Radu, Vladimir, um, and Matej. And then a lot of people from NEC, um, Joao, Felipe, Roberto, Felipe, and Mo. And Georgios from MIT and Mark Hendley from UCL. So uh, before I actually go and tell you about my system, about our system, sorry. <laughs> um, the purpose of it is to give in-network processing to everyone. So why might we need in-network processing? So this is an image of the internet today. It's a, obviously a very simplified image. So you've got a server and a client, and traffic typically would go directly from the server, from the client to the server, um, and uh, be terminated there. But in today's networks, you have at least two other places where there's processing done in the network on that traffic that's more than just packet forwarding. So typically in operator networks, you've got things that are deployed that are called, uh, that are called middle boxes. And in this case, uh, we might have a deep packet inspection service. And this thing essentially allows the operator to tell whether some traffic is, for instance, uh, lower priority, such as peer-to-peer. -peer, and it allows to, for instance, uh, shape this traffic at peak hours. Okay. Now. Uh, CDN providers and even large content providers such as Google deploy caches close to customers, such as this cache. And the purpose of these caches is to terminate the connections as close to the customers as possible to improve the web browsing experience. So by cutting the RTT, you, you cut the, 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 the three-way handshake of TCP, you cut the uh, uh, key setup uh, time for SSL and so forth, and you get, you get a much better experience, right? And this also allows the providers to optimize the transport with, uh, they use to fetch the data from the origin server. Okay, so this is really not about how people do things today. It's about the observation that if you look at in innovation in the internet in the past 20 years, instead of being done by doing new protocols, we found that new protocols are very hard to deploy. So people actually deploy processing in the network, and that's how you evolve the network. You know, network operators deploy middle boxes, content providers deploy caches and so forth, and there's a lot more processing in the network these days. But the trouble is, this is only available to the very few rich uh, parties. So major content providers, major, major CDN providers, and the network operators. Okay? So our goal is, uh, you know, it's a very socialist goal if you want. Uh, we want to democratize in-network processing. We want to allow everyone to be able to run in-network processing close to, uh, to users wherever they may be. Okay? This sounds like a very ambi ambitious goal. Luckily, the stars seem to be aligning. So there's this ongoing trend that's, um, that's taking, uh, that actually has, is carrying a lot of steam these days, and it's called network function virtualization. So this is um, originating in uh, operators. So operators want to move away from hardware middle boxes that are difficult to scale, difficult to upgrade. They want to move to software middle boxes run on commodity hardware. And to this end, major operators such as the Deutsche Telekom are deploying racks of machines at different uh, locations in their networks. And what we're getting is actually hundreds of mini clouds scattered through the internet today. And the vision at this point is that these mini clouds will be, run, will be used to run operator processing, so stuff they trust. Um, and maybe they will allow trusted third parties to run things on. And of course, we want to do more with this stuff. We want basically to allow third party untrusted um, uh, clients to run processing um, in, these, uh, in these mini clouds. And I've said the magic word cloud. So of course, we, we know how to do clouds. You know, this, this conference, you know, half of it has been about clouds. You, know, you just install Zen or KVM. You, you've got your commodity OSs. And then you put your network processing inside, and we should be done, right? Well, if you think about it, it's actually not as easy. Right? It turns out that cloud techniques uh, that, that we have today are not appropriate for in-network processing for a multitude of reasons. The first reason is scale. So typically, you have tens of VMs on a, on a, on a typical hardware box. Okay? The scales for in-network processing may be two orders of magnitude more. So you might want to, to support uh, processing from thousands of customers on a single box just because, um, I don't know, your city is very popular with all the mobile apps, for instance. Okay? But you don't want to deploy 100 racks there. You still want to have a few racks because fundamentally the traffic is limited. Uh, in intensity, you know, the mobiles can only uh, download, I don't know, 10, 10 Mbps. So it doesn't make sense to provision too much. Ideally, you will have a lot of customers, but those customers may not be processing any large amounts of data at any point, right? Um, the second problem is security. I mean, we're talking about thousands of vantage points where you can run processing, and you can rent out with a credit card or something similar. So basically, this sounds like a botnet, okay? So you can easily rent out these machines and then Pick your favorite target and DDoS them, right? 
This is not an issue in clouds today because clouds such as Amazon EC2 or Azure, they, are, um, they basically are fixed locations and just renting out some machines there doesn't create much damage. But b because it's also easy to defend against such attacks, right? But when you have traffic originating from all over the internet, it's much harder to defend. So we have to do something at design time to prevent these type of attacks. Finally, um, when you talk about performance, basically a lot of works have shown that traditional OSs don't really do networking uh, very fast. So what you need to do is to bypass traditional OSs to make sure you get the performance. So obviously, uh, all of these three point to the, the problem that you know, if you just adopt cloud techniques that are in use today, it's not gonna work very well for in-network processing, okay? So the, the, the insight of our work, uh, it's, it's, it's an obvious one really, right? In-network processing is not general purpose processing, so we don't actually need a VM abstraction for it, right? Instead, we will, we will give uh, clients of in-network processing, we'll give them a, a restricted abstraction, but we will do our best to run that abstraction in a way that is very fast and has all the properties we want. And this abstraction is, is, is the click modular router that you have heard about in the previous talk, so I'm very grateful for that, I don't have to explain it to you. Um, all right, so in brief, our architecture has four uh, major components. So we have an API that first allows clients to uh, express their processing to, to operators, and the second thing they express is some requirements they, they expect that the running processing will, will obey, and I'll, I'll give you an example for that uh, immediately. The second thing is a set of security rules that ensures that this processing cannot be used to DDoS other people, okay, and among others, okay. To implement all of these, we actually use static analysis. So we use a symbolic execution tool to, uh, that runs at the controller, and the symbolic execution tool decides before we instantiate processing whether that processing is safe to run without any sandboxing or whether you need sandboxing. And the hope is that for most processing, you don't need any type of sandboxing, and this makes it very cheap to run many uh, processing for many users. Finally, we have built an in-net platform that can support thousands of clients. And uh, in, during this talk, I'll try to give you give some insights about all of these components. Uh, unfortunately, the time is very short, so I'll, I'll basically use an example to drive um, this description. And if you want more details, uh, either talk to me after the, um, uh, the talk or uh, just, just look at the paper. So here's how you do, uh, you know, if you've got an operator, this is a cellular operator, you have some mobiles on the left hand side, you've got the internet link on the right hand side, and you've got some routers in your network, okay? So if this operator wants to do uh, in-network processing and NFV, it will deploy some processing platforms. Each of these platforms might be one rack or multiple racks of, of, of machines, okay? Now, on each of these platforms, you will have a number of slots to run processing. We call these processing modules just to highlight the fact that they may not necessarily be virtual machines. They may be something else, okay? Just because we want to support many users, okay? Controlling all of these guys is a centralized controller. This is very much looking like a regular cloud, so this decides what to instantiate where. And the first thing you might use these platforms for is to uh, to run the operator's own processing. So the operator might decide that, first of all, I want to differentiate between HTTP and non-HTTP traffic. So non-HTTP traffic will go via the top platform and HTTP traffic will go via the bottom platform, right? So this is a load balancing decision. And then I want to uh, put an HTTP optimizer and the web cache, deploy them in this platform, and basically all of the traffic should go, all of the HTTP traffic should go via that, um, that platform. And this is the policy of the operator, right? The operator expects that any processing that is installed by any client will obey this, uh, uh, th 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 these rules, right? Uh, the, finally, all mobile operators actually NAT traffic, so you don't get a public IP address, so what the provider will do, it will actually instantiate some NAT and some firewall on this platform, and then all the traffic will be NAT as it comes out. Okay, so this is all fine, this is all operator processing. What might clients want to run on this network? So the simplest example is the following. Consider a mobile app wanting to receive asynchronous notification from a server. Uh, the asynchronous notifications might be, you know, someone writing on your wall in Facebook or an e email message or who knows what, okay? So typically, if you had an IP address, the server could just send the message to you, but of course, this doesn't work because you're behind the net and the message will not get to you, okay? So what people do today, including Google and, and, um, and Apple, you ha they have the mobile phone open a connection to a cloud server, okay? And they keep this connection active by sending keep alives, and this ensures that the net state um, at, at this middle box does not expire, okay? And as long as you have connection running, you can always send the message back. But the problem is, these keep lives are actually draining, draining the battery of the mobile device very quickly, okay? I mean, uh, there's been a lot of work showing that the mobile device battery consumes, um, the, the mobile device radio consumes a lot, even if you just send one, one single packet. 
Okay, so how might we use our platform to support this use case? Okay, so the client will have to specify a processing request, and the processing request has two parts. The first part is a click configuration, and the second part is a reachability requirement. I mean, don't get scared by this. I will briefly uh, tell you what, what uh, every line does. So the first element says, "Give me packets coming from the uh, from the internet from from from, from the um, from the NIC." The second uh, element says, I only want UDP packets destined to port 1500, so this is basically acting like a firewall. Finally, the third element says, all packets that have made it to this point change their destination address to my private IP address. Okay, so basically, wherever this processing runs, if it gets packets, it will rewrite the destination address and forward them to the customer, okay? The fourth, the fourth element is a special type of queue that only sends packets out in batches, right? So in this particular case, it batches with a period of two, uh, two minutes. And this is done to, to make sure that the battery of the mobile device has time to sleep in case you get multiple, uh, multiple notifications. Finally, this goes out um, on the network interface, okay? So the processing is very easy to understand. It's, an, it's a simple example. Now, the second part actually tells the provider what the client expects to happen end to end, okay? So in this case, the client says, look, I expect reachability. So I expect to be able to receive packets from anywhere, that means 0.0, .0 to my private IP address as long as the protocol is UDP and the destination port is 1500, okay? And when it instantiates the processing, the provider needs to make sure that this requirement holds, okay? So the provider will get this, uh, this configuration. It will basically run some, some tool at the controller and it will try to see if there's any platform where it can run this processing to satisfy both its requirements and the client requirements. If it finds such a platform, it instantiates the processing, and then it returns to the client as all clouds do, it returns an IP address where it can contact its own processing, okay? So this is, this, this is simple enough, but you know, the, the secret sauce is really, how do you do static analysis to understand what these middle boxes do? And for this, we use this uh, symbolic execution tool that we have developed previously that's called Simnet, and it, this runs at the controller. So the controller knows the provider topology. It, kno it has a snapshot of the routing tables. It, it knows uh, what the policy of the provider is. It knows what other processing is running at this point, okay? And Simnet does not run on the code of the middle box. So you don't get the C code of the middle box and run the symbolic execution on top of it. Instead, Simnet runs on an abstract model of this code. And this is done to ensure it actually runs quickly, okay? So to enable Simnet to understand what click configurations do, we have manually modeled all the click elements uh, out there. And basically, when you get a click configuration, Simnet can easily understand what this click configuration does at the whole because we have these individual models that we can compose. Okay, so let me just show you an example. So this is a snapshot from the previous configuration we had on the table. And this is what symbolic execution would do to check reachability between uh, the left-hand side of the image to the right-hand side. So first we create a symbolic packet where uh, every header field is, is modeled with a variable. Okay, so we're modeling source address, destination address, protocol number, and destination port. Okay, when we start, these are all symbolic values. It means they can be anything. We don't know what they are. Okay? As this packet goes through the first element from NetFront, this element only allows packets through that have the destination IP set to IP3. So the symbolic execution will, will, uh, ex will, will capture this by constraining the value of the destination address to be IP3. Okay, so the only feasible value at this point for destination address is IP3. As we go farther, uh, we constrain the value of the protocol number and we constrain the value of the destination port. Okay. Finally, the last element just rewrites the destination address to this, to this new value. So basically, by looking at this reachability check, we, we can basically say that there is reachability between the input and the output, and this is how the packet looks on the output. Okay. Now, if you had any header field that had no feasible values at this point, you would say that there is no reachability. Okay. Now, coming back to the example we had earlier. So the, the provider is, is given a configuration. It has to figure out where to run it, okay? So what the controller will do is basically this. Let's pretend I run the configuration here. Then I run symbolic execution to check whether the requirement of the, cl uh, of the client is obeyed. So do I have reachability from the internet to the, to the client? And basically, symbolic execution will tell you, you cannot pass the NAT because the NAT will not allow the packet. It just doesn't have the state for it, okay? Now, the same thing happens if you try at the bottom platform, and if, even if it did make it through, here uh, you have the problem that this is UDP traffic going on, on a place where you only need HTTP traffic, so 
if, if it did go through, it wouldn't, pro it wouldn't obey the provider policy. Finally, if you put it here, it actually goes through, so everything is fine. So what the provider will do is actually instantiate the processing here, make sure that um, uh, the proper load balancing is, is, is in place to, to ensure that traffic goes to the client processing and so forth. Okay, so currently I've, I've, talked, uh, I've talked a bit about correctness. How do you do security? Okay, so we have two major uh, security rules that we apply. First of all, processing modules cannot spoof packets. And this is to ensure you cannot use our, our platform to, to launch you know, DDoS reflection attacks and stuff like that. So um, this translates into two rules. Processing modules can either leave source addresses unchanged of packets that they forward, or if they do change the source addresses, it has to be uh, to a new IP address that belongs to the platform they're running on. Okay? And we're also constraining the destination address of packets. And here the rule is actually more drastic. Basically the rule says you're only allowed to send traffic to destinations if they agree. Okay? Agreement can be either explicit via whitelist or implicit in that you're only allowed to send traffic to some, some server out there if the serv only if the server contacts you first. So in, in a sense, if you're a web server, you get a get request, you're allowed to reply, but not, you're not allowed to uh, reach out directly. And this ensures we don't get DDoS attacks with SIMnet. With, uh, within that. So how do you actually implement these security rules? Of course you could sandbox things, but sandboxing is actually very, very expensive. And we've implemented sandboxing, we've measured it. So in the worst case, you get a 30 to 60% hit in throughput for minimum size packets, and that's not very good, really. So instead we use uh, SIMnet to check security. So again, this is exam the example we had before, the processing module. And then this is, so what we do is we do symbolic execution, and we check on the output, we check whether um, the rules we have uh, set out are obeyed. So we basically, to, to check the first rule that the source, this, the, the source IP address is not changed, we looked at the differences between the packets going in and packets going out. In this particular case, nothing has changed. So we don't know the value of the source IP address, but we know that it hasn't been changed. So the, rules, the rule is obeyed, okay? And next, we look at differences in the destination address. In this particular case, the destination address has been changed, but it has been changed to an IP that belongs to the client, so this is allowed, okay? All right, so um, the question now is, how do you build a scalable platform that can scale to thousands of customers? To do this, we uh, use Zen, and we uh, use our previous work from um, uh, NSDI last year that's called ClickOS. So ClickOS is essentially a virtual machine that is optimized to run Zen, okay? Now, ClickOS um, is really optimized to run Zen very, very quickly, but it doesn't, it's not optimized to run for scalability. So it's not optimized to, have, to give you like thousands of VM or single box. So to optimize for scalability, we took three different approaches. First, we observed that you could actually keep uh, the VMs on disk and only boot them when you see traffic from that client. And because ClickOS boots very fast in around 30 milliseconds, that's possible. And if you have stateful uh, processing, we've implemented suspend resume support in ClickOS, again, with, with similar uh, delays. So basically, you can bring machines up and down dynamically just to hold uh, ma many customers on the same box. But what I'd like to tell you a bit more about is, um, is this uh, scalability that we enable via static checking. Okay, so if you just use one VM per client, you're fundamentally limit by, limited by a number of uh, bottlenecks in Zen and in virtualization in general. So what if we could run multiple users per the same VM while still offering isolation? And it turns out you can do this as long as you're sure that any individual configuration provided by the customer is safe. And we use static analysis to figure out whether the configuration is safe, and if that's the case, then we basically multiplex multiple users on the same VM. And let me just show you a number. There's a lot of work and graphs in the paper. I don't have time to cover uh, even like uh, a small percentage of them, but so what this graph shows is, as we're increasing the number of clients downloading from a web server, we assume that these are DSL clients, for instance, and each, each one has a 50 megabit um, a bottleneck link. As we're increasing the number of clients, we're showing the total throughput of the middle box, that, uh, of the platform that actually is supporting uh, firewalls for all of these clients at the same time. So each of these clients will have a simple firewall that uh, dictates what traffic can go through and whatnot. And what we see is that you have linear scalability up to about uh, 1,000 customers, and uh, this is actually a fairly low-end machine. I think it's a six-core machine. It costs today like you know, 1,500 euros, so it's actually very cheap to support 1,000 customers. So to understand how people might use um, uh, InNet, we actually looked through all of these use cases, but obviously I don't have time to, uh, to discuss uh, all of them, so I'll just come back to the use case I mentioned earlier, push notifications, right? Remember that the idea was here, instead of doing keep alives, 
what you do is you, you, you explicitly tell the operator, look, I want you to forward these packets to me, and if you get many packets, don't forward them as they come along, just batch them, okay? So that you don't wake up my radio uh, too, uh, too frequently, okay? So here what we measured is, we said, okay, let's look how the energy consumption of a Galaxy Nexus mobile phone looks like when you're getting uh, packets every second, but you're batching them at different frequencies. And as you see, obviously, the more you batch, the more you save, and uh, you see that th th there's a big difference. You know, you're drawing 230 milliwatts um, if, you, if you're not doing, uh, or if you're doing very little batching, and you're drawing r uh, roughly half of that if you're doing a lot of batching. So clearly, there's an incentive for applications to do this. All right, so um, to conclude, we believe that in-network processing is something you want to have widely available because it will enable innovation in, um, in a lot of different ways, but the cloud techniques we have today are just not applicable to in-network processing. So what we did is we, we created a specialized API that's based on the click module router and allows clients to explicitly state what they expect from the uh, configuration to achieve. And to implement this stuff, we, used, we relied on static analysis uh, to, first of all, avoid sandboxing, to uh, consolidate multiple users on the same VM, uh, and to ensure that operator policies are obeyed. Okay, so um, to understand whether this would be practical, we actually looked at the trace of the Maui backbone link. So this is a, a link in Japan that's, uh, that's run by um, one operator, and they're very nice because they give you snapshots of, of traffic every day. They are anonymized. So what we looked at is we counted the number of distinct clients, at active clients at any point in time, and we found it's between 500 to 700. So the takeaway of this talk is that you could actually put a single box uh, on that Maui backbone link, and you could run personalized processing for every single user of that link, uh, whether it is a personal firewall or, uh, I don't know, whatever they want to run. Okay? Um, all right, so with that, I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Back there. Peter Pietzloch, Imperial College, London. Um, how difficult is it to do the modeling of click modules? So if, an, if an ISP wants to implement a new module, what do they have to do before you can, you can well, statically reason about the module? So um, the modeling itself clearly requires you know, an expert to do it. Um, Click in particular is not very complicated because most of the elements are stateless and it's, they are fairly easy to, to model. Uh, so in click, the difficulty is in modeling the IP rewriter and uh, a few other elements that keep state. Okay, and let's let's say it's it's moderately difficult, but it's 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 not really a big problem. The problem is when you're trying to model something that's complex and it's not as clearly cut as a click element. So we've we, we have uh, ongoing work that tries to model a Cisco uh, ASA, for instance, an application security appliance, and there we're taking this. If you want a black box approach where you're putting traffic in and seeing what's coming out, and then we're looking, reading specs and reading uh, configuration languages and so forth, and you're finding that it's incredibly difficult to derive an accurate model because you actually don't know what the middle box does. It's, it's so difficult. So um, if you had access to the source code, of course, it would be a lot easier, but uh, we don't. So in general, if you have access to the source code, um, it's definitely feasible to do it manually, and we think we can build some tools that will help you do it, you know, semi-automate this task. But um, if you just have black box middle boxes, uh, there's, it, it's very difficult to do this. Thank you. Hi, Jacob Hansen, Bromium. Uh, this is really cool work. Uh, it did remind me of the active networking stuff that was going on in the 90s, where people were doing this with Java, essentially. And uh, they, they, back then they had a model where they could kind of uh, on demand install uh, their, their little applets or whatever they were uh, based on some hash or something. Uh, did you think about how you're going to, you know, how, how are you going to install these things on demand in response to customer requests and how are you going to garbage collect them eventually when they're no longer needed? So um, I didn't catch the last part of your question. Could you just so how, how are you going to install these? Uh, how do you know which ones to install? And how do you know when to delete them afterwards? Right. So I mean, the, um, our deployment model is something like, like the cloud. So uh, whether the client directly connects to the operator or you have some aggregator and so forth. It's, so, it's, so it's basically, at some point, someone says, I want you to install this 
processing for me. And uh, at that point, our our model is that you know we, we will we will put this on a machine and mark it as as, as being active. And when you see traffic for for that processing module. If it's not in, uh, if it's not running, it's not in memory um, at that point. You just bring up the VM, you boot it up, and it's you know 30 seconds, 30 milliseconds to just boot it up, or uh, you, you can actually consolidate it. So uh, it, it, you basically have to run everything you have uh, for stuff that's uh, idle. You can put it to disk, and then you can bring it up, or you know maybe, maybe suspend it to memory. So it's uh, basically you, you have to run everything you get. More or less, but the the model would be that people have to pay for this. So, uh, if you ask who's going to pay, is it the actual end users? Probably not. Probably the mobile applications running on the end users will have some deal, um, and they will somehow pay for this stuff. Thanks. Yeah. Questions? I have one. Thank you. Ah, sorry, I have one. <laughs> Let me still ask the question. So, um, so do you have numbers on the uh, scalability of the static checking that you do? I would imagine if you have thousands uh, of users, you have a lot of configuration changes. That yeah, just just give me a second. I can, I can show you. I can show Sorry. You. So, uh, basically, uh, the uh, the answer is it scales really well because the models we built are built with symbolic execution in mind, and in general, the branching factor in these networks is not that high. Uh, but, uh, okay, so this is the image I want to show you. Uh, so basically, this is increasing the number of uh, middle boxes at the operator, and this is showing how much it would take to actually check it with, with SimNet. So you see that um, a, part, a big part of this is compiling the, the model, which is written in Haskell, compiling it and then running it is actually very, very fast. So um, static checking is really fast. The, the secret ingredient is, is, is really the model. Like the model is written in a way, you know, it there are no loops. Uh, you know, it's 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 really written for static for for symbolic execution. Thank you. Let's thank Cheers. the speaker again.